So we've examined the way that social media identity has blossomed from a shared identity born out of gender notions in Hollywood and early online communities. So let's get a bit meta here. There's a self-reflexive factor going on as well. Films also have a lot to say about online media use and feminine identity. So let's take a closer look at how women in film also perceive themselves online. Did you just unfriend me? Take an early example of this in a personal favorite film of mine. Nora Ephron's 1998 You've Got Mail stars the dynamic duo Meg Ryan and Tom Hanks in another romantic comedy about two 30-somethings who met in an online chat room and start up an email correspondence despite unknowingly being each other's competitor in the Upper West Side bookstore business. Before we get carried away with the details, the film is a great example of a young woman's quest to find out who she is, online and offline, while navigating a digital relationship. Ryan's performance highlights her sometimes cautious behavior writing emails to Hank's character. In life, they're at odds. She's beautiful, but she's a pill. Online, they're in love. A very significant element of the plot reveals that Ryan's character is mostly unhappy in her real-life relationship and able to reveal more of herself to Hank's character Hank. via her emailing and instant messaging. Days later. Please come up. No, I don't really think that that is a good idea because I have a terrible cold. <laughs> Moving 10 years ahead, Efron's 2009 film Julie and Julia again explores the way in which a young chef, Julie, played by Amy Adams, copes with keeping up her online persona on her blog about Julia Child's recipes. While Julie learns of her friend's success from Showtime buying her blog, she feels an urge to have the same. In the film, Julie's blog serves as an online professional identity to supplement what is lacking in her real one, a dull, unsexy office job. No. What is noteworthy here is that Julie is using the blog profile to not just create an online persona, but to revamp her real-life self. She is in fact trying to make herself more interesting in real life. 364 days to go. One interesting moment in the film happens when, through a self-reflexive cinematic move, she watches footage of Julia cooking and admires Julia's persona on screen all the way down to her pearls. Later, she's wearing pearls, a sign that she was strongly impacted by Julia's image on screen. In a way, Julia to her TV cooking show is what Julie is to her blog. Julia's television persona is larger than life and it lures Julie in. No fear, Julia. No fear. She desires to please Julia and perform for a larger audience through her online cooking hub. However, to Julia's disappointment, she learns that Julia does not approve of her. Julia Child began learning to cook because she loved her husband, and she loved food, and she didn't know what else to do with herself, and in the process, she found joy. I didn't understand this for a long time, but I do now. Julia taught me that. But here's what Julia really taught me. She taught me to cook. Jumping back to 2004 in Mark Rosman's A Cinderella Story, a modern teen take on the Disney classic, the protagonist Sam, played by Hilary Duff, communicates with her Prince Charming via an online chat for accepted Princeton students. This film is a cult classic, rife with the color pink, a token blonde, and a full Cinderella transformation that leaves Prince Charming speechless when he sees his chat room Princeton girl Sam turn up to the Halloween school dance as Cinderella. An interesting twist on the movie makeover trope and online persona, it can't be ignored that both Sam and her Prince Charming romanticize her online persona, especially since she shows up as an anonymous princess and then quickly returns, a la Cinderella style, to the average American teen lifestyle and chores that await her. While the film eventually reveals Austin's love for the real Sam, there's no doubt that Sam hides behind a digital and physical mask because she does not want Austin to find out and be disappointed by her real identity. In fact, I would be remiss not to speak more to deception in online profiles by examining Ariel Shulman and Henry Yust's 2010 documentary Catfish. 
This documentary points to false image promises on social media sites, as seen in our protagonist Neve's search for who he believes is the daughter of a friend via her Facebook profile. I, I fell in love with you. You know what I mean? With my picture, well, not right. with me as a well, person, right. but of yeah, yeah. Of course, as catfishing would go, Neve finds out that his faux girlfriend's mother actually set up the account and has been the recipient of Neve's Facebook messages from the start. Um, this is uh, 1211. It's the phone number that was one that was for Megan. And this is 0580. And that was mine. Quite literally, behind Megan's beautiful photos lies not Megan, but her mother. A symbol for disappointment when not the attractive young female the Facebook profile promised. The personalities that came out were just fragments of myself. Fragments of things I used to be, wanted to be, never could be. More recently, Bo Burnham's 2018 film, Eighth Grade, documents eighth grader Kayla's journey to discover her own image through her online identity. In the opening sequence, Kayla begins her morning by following real-life beauty YouTuber Olivia Jade's going out makeup tutorial with a sequence of shot reverse shots alternating between Kayla and Olivia as the two synchronously do their makeup. The point of this scene, as we find out, is to take a Snapchat titled, Just Woke Up Like This, uh, which implies that Kayla's learned normative social media behavior translates to a digital images she wishes represented how she really looked in the morning. The film goes on to explore how Kayla feels most confident when the barriers of digital technology actually allow her to curate a persona she prefers. Interestingly, Kayla nearly abandons her vlogging because she feels that her real-life self cannot compare to the one on the screen, but then ultimately salvages her YouTube career. I can't really actually do that stuff. Um, and, yeah. The last important film I choose to examine is Ian Samuel's 2018 Netflix film, Sierra Burgess is a Loser. Sierra Burgess's name kind of gives away what we can expect from the film, in that it is a modern take on the acclaimed French play Cyrano de Bergerac, while Sierra says, I feel sometimes like you're the one teenager who doesn't obsess over looks. She is also quick to conceal her identity because of her looks. If you're gonna pretend to be me, be normal. Or you can just style low. Do you have any idea what it's like to be a teenage girl and to look like this? Sierra conceals her identity from her crush, Jamie, because she doesn't believe she is feminine enough. Yet, Sierra maintains a digital relationship with him through texting, FaceTiming, and phone calls by visually subbing in Veronica, the beautiful, popular cheerleader, and dare we say, an updated 2000s American cult movie high school princess trope, on FaceTime and in person. Sierra feels pressured to maintain the lie that she is in fact Veronica because she believes that Jamie will not value her since she is not conventionally attractive. This particular theme is seen in A Cinderella Story as well. The young female protagonist fears rejection once the male love interest sees them out from behind the screen. The film directly deals with the social pressures of appearing beautiful online, in social media profiles, and in person in the 21st century. My heart's pounding! My heart's pounding! <laughs> that was so stressful. This project originated as an investigation into the cultural historicity of Instagram accounts that appear on my suggested feed, which immortalize and bring back the 2000s normative gender images from Hollywood. The fact that these images were used to, one, oppose ground gained by the late 20th century feminism by patriarch Hollywood system, two, psychologically transmit a sense of reality and identity upon young girls and women to shape gender notions, and three, concretize gendered behavior on social media sites and change the way women create online profiles and are resurfacing on an online platform that gives them a second life is a true indicator of their long-term effects on American and global society. In fact, as Johnston points out, quote, as a technology able to picture and embody the temporality of the past, cinema has become central to the mediation of memory in modern cultural life. 
unquote. Based on the research from the multiple studies I examined throughout this project, it is clear that Hollywood's influence in American and global media is directly correlated to a strong divide in social media use and profile identity in young women millennials and Gen Zers. Hollywood's national and global reach is pervasive enough to create strong notions of identity in the developing and adolescent American minds, so the cause and effect of these filmic images gets diffused to a vulnerable audience, digested, and ultimately regurgitated in an attempt to emulate beauty and identity motifs observed on screen. The ensuing generational consequence of how young teens and women choose to portray themselves online is the result of these images deployed to consumers at appropriate ages when they think about their cultural identity. The sexism in these Hollywood films is deeply rooted in the controlled images of women, specifically put in place by a patriarchal film production tradition. The lack of women directors and producers involved in the cult films examined throughout this study reveal an inherent lack of a woman's control over her own gender expression. It is clear that one solution to redefining and continuing to ameliorate the normative gender images in Hollywood cinema, and if not also attempt to alleviate the gender burden imposed on young social media users, is to bring women to the forefront of these films targeted towards young girls, teenagers, and women.